Hello, everybody. So, um, today we're going to talk about, um, music and, um, music theory, uh, musicology, study of music, um, and, uh, we're just gonna kind of dive right into it. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, according to the definition of musicology on the Wikipedia, which I know not everybody uses, but, um, I'm just going to use it for right now. Um, so music, musicology is a Greek word, you know, music, analogy, study of music. It's a scholarly study of music, right? Musicology research combines and intersects with many fields, including, um, psychology, so sociology, acoustics, neurology, natural science, Natural sciences, excuse me, formal sciences, and computer sciences. Um, musicology is traditionally divided into three branches. Music history, systematic, systematic musicology, and uh, ethomusicology. Ethomusicology, however you want to pronounce that. Historically, musicologists study the history of musical traditions and, I'm sorry, uh, musical traditions, the origins of works, and the biographies of composers. So, ethnomusicologists draw from anthropology, particularly particularly um, field research, to understand how and why people make music. Systematic musicology includes music theory, um, aesthetics. Uh, Pedagogy, if I'm pronouncing that right, musical acoustics, the science and techno, uh, technology of musical instruments, and the musical uh, implications of social arts, psychology, sorry, um, sociology, uh, psychology, philosophy, and computing. Uh, cognitive musicology is the set of phenomena surrounding the cognitive model, modeling of music. When musicologists carry out research using computers, the research often falls under the field of, uh, compute, oh, computational, yeah, computational musicology. Music theory is a specialized form of applied musicology which is sometimes considered more closely affiliated with health fields and other terms regarded other times regarded as part of musicology proper. So, okay, so that's just explaining uh, those three three types of musicology: uh, music history, systematic music uh, musicology, and ethnomusicology. So. Um, now, for everybody listening, I did not go to college and study music at all. Um, I, I've just been studying music, uh, music theory, and um, instrumentation, um, comp- uh, composers, compositions, and stuff like that on my own because I, you know, I love music, and you know, it's a huge hobby of mine. And, um, I really do like, un- you know, trying to understand the, uh, fundamentals of music. And, um, whenever you're looking at a, uh, composer's work, I like to look at it and see how all the instruments come together to form certain sounds and chords and melodies and harmonics and, and rhythm and all that. It's really, it's really interesting to me. Um, so, uh, I'll read this little, sort of little bit right here. Um, uh, the 19th, the 19th century philosophical trends that led to the reestablishment of formal musicology education in Germany and German and Austrian universities 
had combined methods of system uh, systemization with evolution. These models were established not only in the field of physical anthropology, but also cultural anthropology. This was influenced by Hegel's ideas on ordering phenomena from the simple to complex as as the stages of evolution are classified from primitive to developed and stages of history from ancient to modern. Uh, Comparative methods became more widespread in musicology beginning around 1880. Okay. Um, So so that's basically talking about... uh, where the study of um, all that stuff came from. And I'm not a big, you know, I don't know that much about philosophy. I I know a little bit about philosophy. I don't know that much about uh, psychology or sociology or anything like that. I'm not a major in it or professional in it by any means. Um, So we're actually going to focus a little bit about – Music theory. So, music theory is the study. Okay, this is all according to. I have my own definition, and then like Wikipedia has their own definition. So, I'll tell you their definition for people who don't understand, you know, or wouldn't understand my definition. So, music theory is the study of theoretical frameworks for understanding the practices and possibilities of music, um, which is actually really good uh, definition. Okay. Um, that, okay, let, we'll just read this. The Oxford uh, Companion to Music describes three interrelated terms, I mean, excuse me, interrelated uses of the term music theory. The first is the rudiments that are needed to understand music notation, key signatures, um, time signatures, and rhythmic notation. The second is learning scholars' views on music from antiquity to the present. And the third is a subtopic of musicology that seeks to define processes and general principles in music. Um, the music, music, the music, uh, musicological, musicological approach to theory differs from music analysis and that it takes as its starting point not the individual work or performance, but the fundamental materials from which it is built. Okay, so that's actually a uh, really in-depth uh, definition of music theory. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I would, that's what I, I would say too. If, if anybody would ask, um, what is music theory? Uh, in my own words, I would just say it's yeah, it's uh. It's how you find out um, how to make a chord, you know, in basic terms. Like, how do you make a C major chord or how do you make a C minor chord or, you know, uh, all the different modes in, in music, you know, Lydian, mix, Mixolonian, uh, Aeolian, all that kind of stuff, that the circle of fifths, um, that all entails um, music theory. And, uh, and then, yeah, you can add... Uh, knowing how to read time signatures and key signatures, uh, and then uh, also reading uh, music notation and uh, reading, you know, reading scores or just reading any type of music. You know, that all entails, like, music theory. And uh, music, music theory is a really good um, way to understand everything that's going on when you're – you know, if you're playing an instrument, whether that be the piano, the guitar, the uh, keyboard, even singing. Um, I play the French horn. I play the piano. I play the guitar. Um, I play the trombone in high school. And that's where I really started learning um, how to read music. And uh, that's when I actually really started getting into, okay, like, how does how does all this work? You know, how does, uh, how does, uh, how does all this work? You know, and, uh, you know, how can I learn, you know, maybe another instrument that I want to learn 
or uh, teach somebody else how to play an instrument, you know, and also teaching them how to read music and, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. I'm not going to read everything about music theory on this Wikipedia thing, but I will read some stuff that uh, stands out to me. Uh, music theory as a practical discipline encompasses the methods and concepts that composers and other musicians use in creating and performing music. Um, the development, per, uh, preservation, and transmission of music theory in the sense may be found, in this sense, may be found in oral and written music making traditions, musical instruments, and other artifacts. For example, ancient instruments from prehistoric sites around the world reveal details about the music they produce and predict and potentially something of the musical theory that might have been used by their makers. Or excuse me, yeah, by their makers. Okay. Um, in ancient and living cultures around the world, the deep and long roots of music theory are visible in instruments, oral traditions, and current music making. Many cultures have also considered music theory in more form, formal ways, such as written uh, treaty, uh, treatises, I think that's what that is, and music notation. Practical and scholarly traditions overlap, as many practical treatises about music place themselves within a tradition of other treatises which are cited regularly as a scholarly writing cites earlier research. Uh, I'm not sure what written treat or treatise is. Let me see what it says. Um, a treatise is a formal and systematic written discourse on some subject concerned with investigating or exposing the principles of the subject and its conclusions. So, um, I guess that would be treatise is a formal written or systematic written dis discourse on some subject concerned with investigating or exposing the principles of the subject and its conclusions. Okay, um, I'm not sure. I'll have to get an example. So, uh, moving on. So, talking about music theory. Cause it, okay, so this paragraph was kind of talking about uh, prehistoric uh, music theory and you know ancient instruments from around the world. Which um, would be, you know, like the the dulcimer, dulcimer. I think that's how you say it. Dulcimer, uh, the the leader or something like that. And then the uh, that that instrument from uh, like the Middle East. The I forgot what the I forgot what it was called. It's like some guitar. Thing, uh, but yeah, like so. The Mesopotamian had, you know, they had the lyre. Uh, Egyptians, Egyptians had a harp, a, you know, a wooden arched harp. It looks like, uh, and of course, you know, every almost every culture has had some sort of a flute. You know, the Chinese, you know, they have the Chinese flute. Uh, Native Americans, they have some sort of flute. Uh, Celtic, uh, you know, medieval flutes and everything like that. And they had the little guitar thing. I can't think of the name, but the little guitar thing. And um, so those are some ancient instruments from around the world. And what's really cool, when you know, when you start learning about music theory and, uh, You'll start to, uh, and I don't know if, if, they, if people learn this and if they're majoring in, in an instrument or, or um, music theory in general and everything, but uh, it is interesting to know like what kind of music theory is around the world because in other cultures, for instance, uh, 
Arabian or Middle Eastern music or even Indian music or even Chinese music, they don't use the, uh, the Western, uh, pop, uh, sounding chords or whatever. So typically what the four, there's four chords and almost like every pop song, you know, pop song, country music, almost every song. And usually, usually, you know, you start in the, at the root. So it's, for example, uh, you're playing in the key of C, so you know, C major. And then you would maybe go to, uh, G, you know, suspended or something to the fifth or whatever. And then you go to the, uh, the sixth. And then you would go to the fourth and then back to the root, you know. So that's in a lot of country music. Country music has a lot of that. And, and so does pop music. And, and it is, it is fun. You know, it's not, I know some people might think, oh, um, oh, it sounds like too repetitive. And it is, but the whole point of music is to really have fun and enjoy it, you know. And, you know, unless you're like, Maybe in college or something where, where you're, um, you have to make a song or you, or you have to, yeah, you have to compose a song or something in a particular mode or, or a particular key, you know, or time signature or whatever, you know, maybe that, maybe that might not be fun. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's all about having fun. You know, these, um, composers, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, Gustav Holtz, um, Stravinsky, Tchaikovsky, you know, all those classical and romantic composers, you know, they were having fun. Now, I know some of it was, was for, uh, religious purpose. I know that. And then, but also, um, some, I mean, those kind of composers wrote some of their songs and, they were in, you know, they were, they might have been in German or, or something. And, um, only people who only speak English, they might, they may not know what the title of the song means or something. But I know Mozart wrote some vulgar stuff in his composing, I heard. So, um, but no, he, he is a good composer, obviously. Mozart, I think, is really good. Um, I think my favorite composer would be, Gustav Holtz, just because, oh, and, uh, Strauss. The one, he wrote the, uh, a lot of stuff about, it. I'm pretty sure he wrote the Alpine Symphony. And, um, but yeah, Gustav Holtz wrote the planets, you know, Jupiter being the big main one. And that's my favorite one. I love that one. Um, uh, so, uh, but yeah, so that's just some of the uh, ancient instruments and everything. And um, uh, let's go. Okay, let's go on because um, I do want to talk about some of this stuff that it's that the Wikipedia is saying. Okay, so music music theory is often considered with abstract musical aspects such as tuning and tonal systems, scales, consonants, and dissonance, and rhythmic relationships. In addition, there is also a body of theory concerning practical aspects, such as the creation or the performance of music, orchestration, ornamentation, improv, so improvisation, um, and electric or electronic sound production. A person who researches or teaches music theory is a music theorist. Okay, so I guess there's a name for that. I I guess, yeah, that would make sense. Uh, university study typically to, or yeah, university study typically to the MA or PhD level is required to teach or tutor track music theorists in a U.S. or Canadian university. Okay, uh, methods of analysis include mathematics, graphic analysis, and especially analysis enabled by Western music notation, as I was kind of talking about earlier. Um, comparative, descriptive, statistical, and other methods are also used. 
Music theory textbooks, especially in the United States of America, often include elements of music, musical uh, acoustics, considerations of musical notation, and techniques of tonal composition, um, in quotes, harmony and counterpoint, among other topics. Okay, so, yeah, so, yeah, that makes sense. Um, when you're in college, you study music theory. Obviously, yeah, you'd be a yeah, music theorist and everything. So it's, it is, so this, uh, whole paragraph that I was reading has a lot of points that I want to touch on. Um, so obviously music theory, you know, you have forms of music, orchestration, ornamentation, improv, and a lot, uh, electronic sound production. So. Yeah, so, so any, I'm not knocking, and I want to make sure people understand this. I'm not knocking anybody that, that, um, doesn't read a sheet of music at all, or, uh, you know, doesn't even know that much about music theory at all. You know, this is, this is just, I just like studying music theory and, you know, music in general for, for, uh, fun. It's, uh, it's, I love it. And so, um, because you can do a, People who don't know that much about music theory or can't even read music at all, they're some of the best musicians in the world. You know, for instance, jazz. I mean, in jazz, you don't really have a lot of sheet music, you know, unless maybe you're performing, you know, you have to perform really good or it's a certain song or something. But a lot of it's just improv. You know, you're just improv. You know, the uh, pianist is just improv the saxophonist is just improv the bassist, the drummist, everybody, the whole band, saxophone, trumpet, you know, everybody is all just doing improv. Um, now, um, and a lot of it is really great. I've heard and still continue to hear really great jazz music and other songs. They're just all improv, and these people can't even read any sheet music at all. So, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. I'm not knocking anybody that can't read music at all. I mean, a lot of my stuff, I, I improv too. You know, if I'm wearing a song, if I'm wearing a song, you know, um, for instance, uh, I, I will, uh, play like covers of songs, you know. I typically don't use sheet music. I'll just kind of go off the ear. You know, I'll play by ear. Because I, because I, because I, I'll, I already know I can hear the chords, I can hear the, the melody, I can hear the harmony, so I know what chords to play. You know, especially if, if it's a Western song, a lot of Western music, you know, is in that C. You know, you start on C, which is a, you know, the tonic, and then you go to the, uh, the fifth, and then you go to the sixth, and then you go to the uh, fourth, and then back to the, to the root. I said the tonic, I'm sorry. Back to the root. And so, uh, so yeah, I play a lot of music in my ear. Now, certain songs, there are certain songs where, where I'm very picky and I really want to sound like, um, or I really want the song to sound like maybe how I heard the song in the first place and maybe that person or the recording of the song or whatever is played, you know, off a sheet of music and not by ear. So I will look up that, you know, the song's sheet of music. And then I'll learn it that way too. So, okay, so on Wikipedia, so we're talking about music theory, and uh, there's another column here that I want to talk about, uh, the fundamentals of music. So according to Wikipedia, guys, music is composed of oral phenomena. Music theory considers how those phenomena apply in music. Music theory considers melody, rhythm, counterpoint, harmony, form, tonal systems, scales, tuning, intervals, consonants, dissonance, durational proportions, the acoustics of pitch systems, composition, performance, orchestration, ornamentation, improvisation, electronic sound production, um, and etc. So, uh, yeah, that's a whole, that's a lot of stuff. And that is what music theory is. It, it's, it's all that stuff. 
And uh, I know what a lot of most of this stuff is. I don't really know what durational proportions is. I guess duration may be referring to time. I'm assuming uh, the acoustics of pitch systems. I don't know. I'm not sure what that is either. Um, so anyway, um, so we'll talk about some stuff here. Um, okay, so let's talk about pitch. So pitch is the lowest, lowest, I mean, sorry. Pitch is the lowness or highness of a tone. For example, the difference between middle C and a higher C. The frequency of the sound waves producing a pitch can be measured precisely. But the perception of pitch is more complex because single notes from natural sources are usually a complex mix of many frequencies. Um, yeah. According, accordingly, theorists often describe pitch as a subject, uh, subjective sensation rather than the, rather than an objective measurement of sound. So, um, yeah, so I can see that. So, this is a good example. So in um, in Middle Eastern music or Indian music, or and I think maybe maybe uh, Asian music. I'm not sure, but I know in Middle Eastern music, uh, the uh, they don't have like they don't go off what the idea of um, Western uh, music theory in the sense of you know you have your C major scale C E R C D E F G and, you know, ABC, they have a different um, scale, per se, and they also have, okay, so, for instance, if you play a C major scale on the piano, or whatever major, I mean, major chord, whatever, on the piano, or whatever, guitar, whatever instrument, according to a lot of people in America, and Western societies, maybe even, typically, People respond to a major chord as feeling happy. You know, it makes you feel happy. And a minor chord, you know, C, because we're going to just, for the sake of, uh, you know, sake of conversation, we'll stick to the key of C for everything. Uh, but a major chord, C, in the key of C, would be C, E flat, and G. And, uh, and every, every single note, um, has a, uh, I mean, every single uh, key has a uh, minor chord. So, but when you play that that chord, it typically makes people feel, according to Western music, um, sad. You know, minor key is usually typically sad. Um, and then if you play like a, um, in the key of C, if you play an F and A. I mean, F, G, A, and C, or even a uh, an F, B flat, and C, um, it, which is a, a sus chord, suspended chord, it um, it has that feeling of like unresolved, you know, and it needs it needs to be resolved. Same thing for uh, the fifth, so G, because we're in the key C, so G, so G, you can do G, A. And D as a uh, suspended two, and then you could do G, um, B, and C. I mean, sorry, uh, G, C, and D as suspended four. Um, all those suspended chords usually make people feel like, or the, the chord makes. I mean, if I'm, I'm speaking for myself too, it makes me feel like, like, oh, that this, this song or I mean not the song this chord is unresolved or for you know so it makes me want to resolve back to the uh, back to the root so back to the uh, the C C major so um but yeah so uh, what I was saying was uh yeah so in other for instance in the Middle East uh their their whole their whole uh, music theory system is not the same as like Western music theory system, um, because they have, for instance, on the piano, you have a C, C sharp, D, but on their little, uh, it's not a guitar, I forgot the name of the instrument, but 
it's like a guitar, it's a string instrument, and um, it goes from C, and there's a, there's a specific name for this, and I gotta look it up, but it goes from C to C half sharp or something like that, and then it goes to C sharp, and then it goes from C sharp to uh, C sharp sharp or D flat times two or something, and uh, so they have notes in between the notes that we have, which which that's what um, that's what those uh, frequencies are too. Um, but let's go back to uh, back to this um, music fundamentals. Uh, specific specific frequencies are often assigned letter names. Okay, yeah. Today, most orchestras assign concert A, the A above middle C, on the piano to the frequency of 440 hertz, which, yeah, right. Uh, this assignment is somewhat arbitrary. For example, in 1859, France, in 1859, France, the same A was tuned to 430 hertz. Such differences can have noticeable effect on the timber of instruments and other phenomena. Thus, in historical, oh, thus in historical informed performance of older music, tuning is often set to match the tuning used in the period when it was written. Which, right. Additionally, many cultures do not uh, attempt to uh, standardize pitch, often considering that it should be allowed to vary depending on genre, style, mood, etc. So, so right. Um, I'm not, and I'm not really, I'm not sure about this, but I'm, I think that yes, when, uh, classical music was being written or romantical music was being written in the 1800s, 1700s, I don't think the pitch they had is, is what we tune to now. So we tune to A, you know, when you go, if anybody went to go see an orchestra or even played in band or played in a orchestra or whatever, you know, everybody, we all tune, you know, right before a song or any warm up or anything, you know, we all, we all tune. So, and we're usually, we're all tuning to that concert A, which is in 440 hertz. So, and I don't think that it was that back in, uh, well, right here it says, okay, the same A was tuned in 435 hertz back in 1859, France. So, they might have, <laughs> if we were to go back in time then and listen to their song, it might have sounded a little flat to us. But to them, it, it sounded good. So, uh, moving on. The difference in pitch between two notes is called an interval, which, okay, right, yes, we know. The most basic interval is the unison, which is simply two notes of the same pitch. Right, so, um, yeah, so C, because uh, C, we're in the key of C, so C, from C to C sharp is one interval, or even a, ha- a half step too. And then from C to D, which would be two intervals, is uh, also one whole step. So are you so you can do one whole step to D, or you can do two half steps to D. Um, and then you have an octave, which is the same note. So if we're you know C, and you just count up twelve half steps, it will get you all the way. To C, an octave um, above the C that you you played in. Uh, so uh, so pitches of the same letter name that occur in different octaves may be grouped into a single class uh, by ignoring the difference in octave. For example, a high C and a low C are members of the same pitch class, the class that contains all C's, and so, um, okay, musical tuning systems are temperaments determine the precise size of intervals. So tuning systems vary widely within the, within and between world cultures. So in Western culture, they have long been several competing tuning systems, all with different qualities. Internationally, the system known as equal temperament is most commonly Used today because it is considered the most satisfactory compromise that allows instruments of fixed tuning, uh, example the piano, to sound 
uh, acceptably in tune in all keys. All right, so uh, so you have some instruments that uh, sound out of tune. Example, uh, the French horn. The French horn is naturally out of tune. It's uh, it's it's slightly sharp whenever you play a note. So, if anybody who's seen uh, a French horn play, a French hornist play, or seen them in the orchestra or band or whatever, uh, you'll see them with their hand inside the bell of the instrument because the instrument is naturally slightly uh, sharp. So when you put your hand inside the bell, you don't put it all the way in there because then you'll be muting the sound coming out of the uh, instrument. So you just put it in there slightly to where you uh, it starts to flatten a little bit until you're in key. I mean, until you're in pitch or key or whatever. So uh, uh, so notes can be arranged in a variety of scales and modes. Western music theory generally divides the octave into, into a series of 12 pitches called a, a chromatic scale, yes. Okay. Within which the interval between adjacent notes is called a semitone or half step, which that's what I was talking about earlier. Um, C to C sharp is a half step or it's a semitone. And then if you count up 12 semitones, that's a chromatic scale. So C, C sharp, D, D sharp or E flat. E, and then E sharp or F natural, F sharp, uh, G, G sharp which is A flat, A, A sharp which is B flat, and then B natural, and then C. So that's, if you count that on the piano, that's 12 uh, half steps. Um, selecting tones from this, this set of 12 and arranging them in patterns of semitones and whole tones creates other scales. Right, so uh, so each note in a, in in a major scale because we're just talking about major scale here. Uh, so you have C, you have D, you have E, you have F, you have G, you have A, you have B, you have C. So each of those notes um, has their own scale, and also. Uh, It'd be a mode too. Like when you start in C, it'd be the uh, Elonian Elonian mode. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that later, uh, or in another video or something. So uh, the most commonly encountered scales are the seven tone major, the harmonic minor, the melodic minor, and the natural minor, which would be I'm pretty sure. The melodic minor in, in the key of C would, would be A minor, I think. Other examples of scales are the uh, uh, the, uh, the tonic, okay, octatonic scale and a penta, uh, pentatonic or five tone scale, which is commonly in folk music and blues, which I think is C, D, E flat, um, F, F sharp. G, A, B flat, C. Maybe, I think. I could be wrong. Non-Western cultures often use scales that do not correspond with an equal, equally divided 12-tone division of the octave. For example, classical Ottoman, Persian, Indian, and Arabic musical systems often make use of multiples of quarter tones. Okay, so half the size of a semitone as the name indicates. So that's what I was talking about earlier. You know, they, they don't just have a C and then they go to a C sharp. They have a C and then they have a little note in between the C and the C sharp, which would be, it'd be half of a semitone. That's how they do that. And it actually, um, it actually is very interesting, uh, to hear. I mean, that's why their music kind of sounds like, it kind of sounds off to us a little bit, but that's because they're playing those little, uh, pitches in between the regular notes, you know, that we have. Um, for instance, in neutral seconds, three quarter tones are neutral thirds, seven quarter tones. They do not normally use the quarter tone itself as a direct interval. Okay, so 
In traditional Western notation, the scale used for a composition is usually indicated by a key signature. Okay, yes. So anybody who's seen a sheet of music, you know, or, you know, and tried to play the song or, you know, on a piano or whatever instrument, and you see that, uh, you see the musical sign, you know, that, that means, um, like, if you're playing in treble cleft, um, and then you have bass cleft, so the key signature would be that little thing that looks like a B or the thing that looks like a hashtag or something. Uh, whenever you're, you would see that right after that, and that would tell you what key you're in. So, for instance, in the key of C, you don't have any uh, uh, key signature at all. There's no, there's no little signs or whatever at all. Um, in the key of uh, E flat, you have two. You would have a little B. Where it were, um, on, uh, it'd be written on the little B line, if you, you know, on a, on the treble clef, or on the bass clef, or whatever, too. It'd be a little B, and there'd be a B flat, sorry, and there'd be, uh, or sorry, um, that little B indicates uh, that it's flat. So, there'd be a B on the B line in the middle, and then there'd be a, uh, Another little B on the E line indicating that it's not E natural anymore. It's E flat. So that indicates that you're playing in the key of B flat. Um, so, and then so on and so on. Same thing for sharp. If you have one sharp, that means you're in the key of G. Because when you go on a piano or a guitar or whatever, and you play from G all the way to the next G, it's G, A, B, C, D, E. And then you have an F, but the F is not natural. The F is sharp. So you play the F sharp, which is just one sharp, and then you go back to the G. So um, so that's all I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we'll get more to it uh, tomorrow. I'll put out some. I'll put out another podcast and everything. But uh, this is my first podcast, everybody, so... Uh, thank you for joining. If anybody joined, uh, I'll probably put this on my YouTube channel too. You can find me at, uh, Tyler Phoenix 2255, uh, as my YouTube, YouTube channel. So T-Y-L-E-R-P-H-O-E-N-I-X and then 2255. So, um, uh, thank you for listening and I, I will post this probably to this, uh, to Podbean. So thank you everybody and, uh, have a good night.